Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us again for another episode of, as we record this, we're not even really sure what the title is going to be, but something like, so I got to my church and there was a pandemic <laughs> and we're, <laughs> we're releasing a whole season of these at once. You've probably already heard one or two. And today, Tim Stevens, uh, a dear friend, a former colleague and uh, executive pastor at Willow Creek is joining us. Tim, thanks so much for making time. Oh man, absolutely glad to be here. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to love to uh, let folks hear a little bit of your story. Mo more people know you than me, for sure. But there's probably somebody who doesn't know uh, kind of who you are or how we ended up, you know, calling each other former colleagues and and the whole bit. So yeah, bring us up to speed. Yeah, I'd be glad to. I think I think our relationship went from um, skeptic to uh, customer uh, client to employee. Uh, back to one of those others again, except a skeptic. I'm not a skeptic anymore, so we can leave that behind. No, but I spent uh, nine years in, in non, the nonprofit world uh, and then joined up with a church in, church startup in Granger, Indiana called Granger Community Church. That was back in 1994. I was on staff there for 20 years, and that's when I think you and I first met was somewhere towards the uh, latter fourth of that or so. And then uh, joined on staff with uh, Vander Blumen as a search consultant and uh, VP over the team in uh, fall of 2014 and was there until COVID hit. And then uh, I made a COVID decision to join the staff at Willow Creek uh, this past April. So I'm an executive pastor at Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago. That's awesome. And, and that's actually, uh, you've turned into quite a good story for us because you did great work uh, for starters everybody's like oh my gosh what are you gonna do now that Tim's gone and like, well we cried for a long time and we will do that because Tim and Faith are great people to have around you in life uh, but from a work standpoint when we first asked you to join the team and Tim said okay I'll come and we were like oh hope this works out but in the background we're like yes <laughs> we were so excited because uh, you know I, I I'd had the ability through God's help and some hard work to have a whole lot of people say help us out but we didn't have any real systems it was sort of a uh, texas way of saying it, it was a cowboy culture like you get your search done this way you get and i said tim can you b build quality control and scalable repeatable systems and and man if you didn't do it because not only did tim build systems but he found his replacement without even knowing it he trained him so as soon as tim left we his his successor stepped into place and we really haven't missed a beat. We've missed you, but we haven't missed a beat. And like icing on the cake, he found a successor with the same first name. So it's just him. Yeah. And first Timothy, <laughs> second Timothy. Yeah, there it was go. first Timothy, second Timothy for a long time. But uh, second Timothy is now first Timothy and you are second. So sorry. But that's, uh, <laughs> that's the way it should be. It's been a great story. And, and, and even cooler to that narrative is to be able to say, we will go the extra mile. Well, what do you mean? Well, when we helped Willow Creek find their new senior pastor, not only did we help them do that, but we gave them our best team member to go run the place as exec pastor. So is that is that something you're trying to make repetitive or is that a one time? Deal? No, it's, it's, yeah, no, it's not a scalable, repeatable system. But <laughs> I it's wonder. a repeatable line, that's for sure. Because well, uh, sure. yeah, we had the pleasure of walking with them through uh, the woods of coming out of their founding pastor and into uh, a new pastor. And uh, yeah, so I, you know, I'll never forget our COO Sutton. Uh, I came back from one of our visits when we were up there working with the search committee and I said, I, I think we're going to lose Tim to Willow. And Sutton said, don't ever say that again. Why would you say that? I said, I can see something's happening. And sure enough, I think Jesus was kind of working on you a little bit. And walk us through that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, it was, um, I didn't see it coming for sure. I think it was uh, January of this year, last year of 2020, when um, Faith said, to, Faith and I were out on a walk. Um, and as you can do in Texas in January, I can't do that anymore. Uh, unfortunately, but anyway, we're out and walking and, you know, she said, Hey, you know, it was kind of a recurring, you know, every six months, every 12 months, check in, you know, any chance going back to be a pastor again? Uh, absolutely not. I mean, I love serving the church. Um, I think I'm done serving a specific church. And so that was January, February, we're going on, on the same walk again. And I said, God's doing something inside me related to Willow. And 
you know, it was, just, it was a short conversation. She says, what is it? I said, I don't know. I'm, I said, you know, I'm rarely uh, adept at understanding my own feelings. So uh, that's what you're supposed to help me with. Um, but it was just something, something that God was doing inside me as I was um, continuing to work on the search. And I think there was a sense of, um, we were at that point uh, working into our second slate of candidates. And so it was a sense of just like, God's got to raise up some people to help this place. And wasn't exactly sure what that meant. And then kind of just put a pin in it in my own heart and mind. And then um, March 31st was the day that uh, William and I were on a call with the elders at Willow and they voted unanimously to call Dave Dummett as their senior pastor. And uh, the next morning, Dave was on the phone with me asking me if I'd come do this with him. So I remember that that conversation at that point we were locked down. It was COVID had just, you know, kind of reared its head and uh I remember saying, getting on the phone with Sutton and then William and just saying like, I don't like, I, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this. And you guys were just so gracious to say, you know what, you don't have a choice, but to explore this. Um, we need you to do it fast because we have decisions to make it at Vanderblumen, but you need to go down this path. And so I so appreciated the, um, the encouragement to kind of explore what God was doing. Well, I, you handled yourself so well through the whole thing. And, and we could do a whole podcast on trying to be a, uh ascending business you know mm -hmm. we talk about um being ascending church you know you, you, people for years have said we want to be a church that raises up people called to ministry or to plant churches or to go to the mission field or whatever but uh you know unfortunately having been a pastor i've actually seen it on church staffs where you get protective of your own people and that's my guy and i can't let them go that's and right. then you get a, a really fearful culture where people are like i don't think i can talk to my boss about this and I just don't see that reflecting what we preach. So any any chance we can get where everybody's, you know, being on the up and up, which you totally were, uh, if we can send and bless, I, I just, I hope it provides a little bit of encouragement to pastors out there who are worried about losing their guys or their gals. And by the way, um, it isn't even your church, much less your staff. It's It belongs to Jesus. So uh, sorry for the sermon. I'll back off. I, you know, a recovering preacher every now and then. No, but it's, you know, I totally agree because to me, when uh, when a, a, a pastor or leadership team has created a culture where people can't talk about what God might be doing in them and, and uh, through them and in their future, it it removes the people that are closest to that person to be able to pray through it, counsel mm -hmm. through it, talk through it, ask questions. And uh, because it's it's like a scarcity men, you know, mentality of like, you know, if we lose this person, how are we going to replace them versus kind of an open handed, kingdom minded. Um, let's kind of explore what God's doing in your heart. God will figure out our needs. We'll get there. It might be hard for a season, but we'll get there. So I, I appreciated that about our conversations as I was leaving coming to Willow. Well, and if you're watching today, you were watching in the early part of 21, and you're, you've probably heard me say this by now, but I'm spending the latter half, latter part of 2020 telling every leader I can tell, 21 uh, is going to be a year of turnover. I mean, it, it just is. Um, there's turnover that didn't happen in 2020 because people hung in there to get through COVID. Um, there's, I want to be near family. This has caused me to rethink my values. There's the job changed. It's not what I, I mean, there's a whole list and you can find content, but I, I think the sooner uh, leaders can get their mind around trying to send rather than as you say, have a scarcity mentality. I think it. I think it'll reflect more of what Jesus wants, and probably, uh, probably won't come back wanting. So yeah, yeah, yeah totally yeah. agree. So okay, so you get to your church now. You knew going in. I mean, you said yes during a lockdown. Who does that? But uh, you you knew going in things were going to be different. But like, what has it? What has been a real challenge for you walking into a brand new church during COVID? Yeah, yeah, there were a lot of things that were not surprising. Um, having, you know, you and I working with the elders at Willow for uh, six to nine months prior to that, um, you know, we kind of we kind of knew what was under a lot of the rocks, and um, Willow really wanted the the next senior pastor to know to come in with eyes wide open, and so we were had privy to that information. we were able to communicate that to senior to candidates. Um, so a lot of that wasn't surprising. We didn't know COVID was going to happen. We didn't know there was going to be, you know, incredibly increased racial tension that were, you know, nine days after 
you know, we started in the office was when George Floyd was murdered. Wow. And so, you know, in the city of Chicago, that was escalated as it were, was, I'm sure, in a lot of big cities. And so that was just, you know, front and center uh, for a season. So, for, well, for it still is, I mean, in a lot of ways. So um, a lot of challenges there. I would say COVID, you know, when you're walking into an organization that has gone through um, a breach of trust, you know, a scandal, um, where people, by nature of your position, they come in not trusting you. Um, and that was a new thing for me. I'd never joined an organization that where I, when I walked in, there wasn't a sense of like, oh, we trust you. Why? Because so-and-so said we should. Also, yeah. because we've seen some of your, you know, what you've done in the past. Um, also, because we're Christians and we're supposed to trust our leaders. So all of that. So walking into a place where trust had been deeply broken, and you know, you think of well, how do you build trust? Well, you spend a lot of time in in proximity with people, across the table, whatever. And in COVID, you can't do any of that. So, um, and you can get there 80, 90 percent in a conversation like this via Zoom, but it's tough to uh, you know, it's tough to see someone's heart um, extensively via Zoom. So it's not the, it's anyway, not, it's not the same. It's not the same. So that's been that's been a challenge that we're still figuring out. I think um, another piece of that, if you know anyone who goes into an organization, you tell them you know don't change anything for a season because you need to build trust. And so as we walked in because of uh, because of COVID and because of the you know last couple of years of uh, downturn for the church because of the scandals. Um, we were walking in and probably within a month or two of being here realized we don't have the luxury of waiting um, to initiate some change. And so that's kind of, you know, that's even more hard when you, you don't have the time to build the trust. You're trying to build the trust through screens and you have to make some changes pretty quick. And so we've been in the uh, middle of that, I think, you know, through summer and fall of 2020, really having to kind of reorient our staff. Uh, save lots of money on staffing, restructure, um, and build a whole new model. We're really excited about where we're, where we're going uh, as a church in the future, but it's going to take some time to get there. Some kind of honeymoon. Yeah, yeah that's right. I, I was talking to another guest on uh, one of the episodes in the series, and I said, golly, I guess you had a, a virtual honeymoon. And I just stopped after I said it. I said, that's the most depressing term I think I've ever heard. Who wants a virtual honeymoon? I mean, that's like really not the point. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's let teach me how do you lead change with a new team when you can't be near them? Yeah, well, ask me in two years if it was successful or not. <laughs> the verdict is still out on that. I think, you know, in a lot of ways, it's doing the best you can with what you have. So um, building relationships, it means spending 30 hours a week in front of a screen, you know, doing lots and lots of one-on-ones. We started by just the first probably month of doing nothing but listening. Mm. So we'd, ha we'd have eight to 10 hours a day uh, with, you know, five to 10 to 15 people on a Zoom screen. Just, you know, what are your challenges? Where do you see opportunities? Where has, has the church been? Uh, um, where has the church succeeded? Where has the church failed in your specific ministry or department or your position? So lots and lots of just listening. Like any, you know, change, you know, the kind of the bell curve of change, you know, good percentage, you know, of early adopters, a percentage of people that probably were never going to move with us, and then a whole lot of people in the middle. Um, that we just taken time to listen to and learn from. We've tried to, and, and I'm sure to some degree successfully and to some degree not, but tried to really talk vision, try and try to tap into what is good about the DNA of Willow. And there's so much that is good about the, uh, the DNA of Willow. Some of it's still alive and bright and vibrant. Some of it's just dormant. It just hasn't been um, focused on in recent years. And so What's really good about that? What can we tap into and kind of, you know, bring alive, kind of, you know, breathe some freshness into it? Uh, because that's the piece that kind of wakes people up and has really given people a sense of connection uh, to what Willow means to them and what Willow might be in the future. That's good. That's good. What Talk to me about, um, I mean, in some ways you were going home again. You Willow's kind of in a church you've looked up to and 
judging by your sweatshirt, you're closer to where you want to live geographically than Texas. But uh, sure. <laughs> talk to me about relocating during a a time when it's hard to relate. Like there are people listening to this right now who are relocating right now, and we're still not fully open. We're still not fully, you know. So. Any tips you've learned on, you know, managing your marriage, managing, you know, building relationships that have come to you the hard way and save us some stupid tax? Yeah, I would say, so we're, as we sit here recording this, I'm about eight months in and um, we still haven't had any large public Sunday gatherings. Uh, we've been experimenting the last six weeks at three of our campuses with very small gatherings. Um, and so, um, you know, there's, 98% of the congregation I've never even been in the same room with and or had a chance to meet uh, in person. And the same would be for Dave and the rest of our team. So family-wise, we've just been trying to engage. So Faith and I, as soon as we got here, we have the advantage and it's new for us. We, we don't exactly know what it is yet, but it's called empty nester season. And so we, we tried it for about a half a year and then COVID hit and our you know son came home. So but he's back again down at Baylor. So Anyway, we've we've uh, we've got this kind of new season that we're experimenting with, and so for us, we've just trying to been try tried to engage together with other couples in the church, um, just you know two at a time, and uh, really that that's been a, a lifeblood for us. It's en enabled us to kind of really, and we've been initiating it. You know, uh, hasn't necessarily been initiated towards us, um, probably mostly because of COVID, but we've just been initiating it and um, meeting with folks as much as possible. And that's really been, uh, that's been really, really helpful. I do think the Midwest is familiar for us. And um, as much as I thought I was never, ever going to return, and I'd said that a thousand times, and I'd sold my snowblowers and shovels and ice scrapers and all of that. Um, but we're back and, and the Midwest really is home for, for us for 47 of my 53 years. So it, there's something about that that's familiar. And uh, that uh, and and being back plugged in, even though I never thought I'd be back plugged into a local church, that connection has been uh, been really good for us again. That's great. So you've had to. Uh, I'm just thinking of all the things you've had to do with the pandemic that you didn't see. Like you've had to do some layoffs. How, how do you fire somebody over Zoom? Yeah, that's been um, that's been challenging. So. You guys helped us with understanding the PPP process, and and that in that helped the church um, April, May, June, and then right. we got to July, and we went through some furloughs. I think we furloughed um, about 80 people. These were folks, and this wasn't related to restructure or downsizing. These were just folks that could do their job. They, they're folks that took care of facilities and did food service and things that just weren't really a thing anymore with buildings being closed. Um, and then we got into the fall and that's when kind of the, the deep cuts as far as like, we need to right size this thing. The church is still staffed like it was uh, size wise, uh, FTEs like it was six years ago when the church was much bigger. Um, and then restructure around a new vision and there's significant restructure that needed to take place around that. So the first thing we did is like, okay, how do we do this graciously during a pandemic? You know, how do you have a conversation like that during a pandemic? So we just thought there are probably people that are here that uh, are here because they have to be, not because they want to be, either because um, just life transition, you know, kids are now home e-learning, but they still have to work because they need the, need the funds and they can't find anything else during, during COVID. Or maybe they just like, they like the previous leaders and the previous vision better than the current leaders and current vision, which is totally fine and legitimate. So we just made a decision in early September, implemented it just like across like every single person on staff, uh, let's give them two weeks to decide kind of if they want off the bus and we'll have a financial care package attached to that that will take care of them well into 2021. And that was, I think that was a hard thing to do because we lost some people that we didn't want to lose, but I think it was the right thing to do. Uh, it gave some people an opportunity to transition that, um, that, that wouldn't have been able to. Uh, one of the guys who's been here for 24 years said, you know what, my grandkids are all on the East Coast, and I didn't know when I'd get back out there, but I knew I needed to, and mm. this gave me an opportunity for that. And others that, you know, I've, I've been looking for a chance to stay home with the kids, and this gives us a little bit of a window to be able to do that. Um, so we're, uh, we had about 100 people take us up on that 
And now wow. we're in the midst of kind of reshuffling and kind of filling the roles as well as uh, staffing some new positions that, that tie into where we're going as a church overall. Yeah, but like I'm, I'm thinking uh, you've done the glamorous travel life with me. Uh, so glamorous. Oh my gosh. And all of us that are in any kind of consulting where you move around have seen this little known movie called Up in the Air uh, with George Clooney. It's like Death of a Salesman, but times 50. And uh, he basically fires people for companies. He's an outsourced person that fires people during layoffs. And uh, I don't know if you remember the end of the movie, the young Anna Kendrick the, she had the br brilliant idea that we could do this virtually. And the first guy she fires kills himself. <laughs> it's like horrible. I mean, it's just, it's, but yeah. it, the point was even, even though flying around makes no sense at all there, man, there's some holy conversations that just have to be face to face. So have you learned anything about when you're forced to not do it face to face? What, what have you found that's pastoral or can soften the blow or, or help? You know, that's, that's challenging because there are times when you just don't have a choice. I, I, I resigned to you via Zoom, you know, from the last time I physically saw you um, and the next time I was, you know, going from like I was on staff and never leaving to I was suddenly at Willow. And so the, it's just, it really is challenging. And, and there's not a lot you're going to be able to do about that. Um, this fall, you know, probably 50 to 70 percent, maybe those conversations were in person or could be in person. And the rest of them were via Zoom because, you know, the person had a health issue or kids or a reason that they weren't able to, to meet in person. And that's really, really hard. And I just think you just got to, like, say it out loud and acknowledge the fact that this is awkward and this is not what we prefer. and This is not the way yeah. we wanted this conversation to go down. Um, I think you can come around them and love on them and their family in other ways, uh, through gifts, through cards, through other ways, just to make sure that they know uh, that you care. Um, I mean, to me, that's the, that's the key thing in any kind of layoff conversation, um, you know, whether it's, whether they're excited about leaving or whether it's for cause or whether it's just like, we don't have a position for you anymore. I think the, you know, the key is coming around with care and especially in the local church context. Um, I think, you know, now that I've worked in nonprofit, for-profit and church, you know, I'm just reminded again, just the deep webs of relationship in church. And that conversation isn't just a conversation with an employee. Yeah. It's, it's their brother and their sister and their aunt and their uncle and their friends and their small group and the, the kids that they hang out with the youth group that all are impacted by that conversation. That's good. That's good. Anything you wish you would have done differently with, uh, you say, oh man, my first hundred days in this mess, I wish I had done X, Y, Z. I think we had some missteps with communication in, in some situations where we should have communicated more. Um, I think we, we were coming in with some assumptions that it took us a few months to figure out either weren't true or landmines that were there that we didn't know. Um, and so you step on one or two of those and then you start to figure that out. So I think we would have probably, um, I, I would have, I'm, I'm the executive pastor of campuses, so I'm direct connect to all of the campus pastors and then to their leadership teams and their staff. And so I think I would have been more aggressive, I, I would have assumed less um, and been more aggressive in communication, over communication um, this summer as we were initiating changes. Um, so that's something that we're learning and trying to catch up as we go. But yeah, that's something that I think we could have done better with. Well, watching the, you know, the, the view from here to Willow, uh, COVID or not, you guys were probably looking at having to make massive change and I can't think of two guys better to try and steward that. And as you said, you know, people ask me all the time, how successful have your placements been? I'm like, ask me in 20 years. Uh, yeah. I'll, you know, so who, who knows? But man, I'm so proud of the way you and Dave are handling what you can um, in a season, unlike really anything we've seen in our lifetime. So thanks. And I, I think, I think the, I think you're right. And it's not, it's not just Dave and me. We've been building the leadership team all summer. All, all last summer and fall. And uh, we got some, I mean, uh, Robin Riley from Mariners and Megan Bagnell from Saddleback and Chris Hahn from Southland and Sharita Harkness from Atlanta from North Point. So we got these like uh, this kind of dream team coming together, which has just been, I think when you have the right team, you can overcome um, just about anything. I mean, anything becomes uh, surmountable if you have the right team around you. And it sure feels like we got the right team. That's great. Well, thanks for making time for us. I know you're busy and uh... I, by now, whatever happened 
to Notre Dame will have happened. So congrats or condolence. I'm not sure which, but. Uh, yeah. Well, I, if we only made it to the championship, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. okay. <laughs> thanks so much, Jim. And thanks to Thank all you. of you. For, thanks to all of you for uh, tuning in. Check out the rest of this series and then watch as we continue this trend of dropping entire series at once. Give us feedback on what you'd like to see more or less of. And we'll look forward to hearing from you. If you want to know the show notes, uh, you're going to want to know Tim's blog, uh, Leading Smart. You may want to know about his coaching networks for executive pastors. You may want to know about Willow. All those things are in the show notes. Just go to vandercast.com and you can sign up to receive that. And uh, we wish you the best, Tim. Wish all Thank of you, you. Are the best. And uh, we'll see you again soon.